what do you think the outcome's likely to be? Look, this is a tough one. I think that there's a high level of scepticism about the polling numbers in Australia, purely because at the last federal election back in 2019, uh, the, pollings, the polling numbers were indicating a decisive Labor victory, and yet the coalition government, the Morrison government, was re-elected. So I think there's a higher level of cynicism this time around. Um, I do think this is very close. I've spoken to a lot of people uh, on both sides of the political aisle about how they're feeling about this election, indeed, in the last 24 hours. Uh, both are confident of winning, and I guess to some extent you'd expect them to say that, but uh, it does tend to indicate that this is going to be a close election. Um, you know, for someone who used to be in government, you'd never want a minority government or a hung parliament, but that is a very, very likely scenario. Get into that a little bit, Stephen. Australians have to vote, and we know that a lot of electorates across the globe have really used a protest vote in recent times to object on the back of COVID, cost of living crisis, other big domestic issues. But this could play out with an independent vote, couldn't it, when it comes to a protest vote in Australia? Yeah, certainly some of the early numbers tend to indicate that there is a higher than usual level of support for independence. And there's also a concerted campaign being driven by an organisation called Climate 200, uh, which is putting uh, significant um, campaign funds into a number of uh, so-called teal independents that are running in some critical seats for the government. So uh, there it does seem to be a higher than usual level of support for independence at this election. And that's, again, just another indicator that a hung parliament is very likely. Stephen, very good morning to you. Um, look, what about the relationship with China as well? I, I find it quite extraordinary, actually, because there's a lot of accusations you can make against Scott Morrison's government, but the Labour accusation of allowing China to expand its influence I into areas which potentially threaten uh, Australia as well, I'm not quite sure how uh, the government could have stopped that Chinese influence expansion. And, of course, we know Scott Morrison has been looking at rearmament and sub submarine deals and what have you as well. I just wondered how the relationship with China was playing out in this election. Well, look, there's no doubt that there continues to remain a high level of friction in terms of the bilateral relationship between Australia and China. But, you know, it's the same between the US and China, between the UK and China. Uh, there's a lot of friction on all of those fronts. I think a lot of the domestic politics saw that the government wanted to turn this election into a so-called khaki election. They wanted to campaign uh, on the basis of it being a national security referendum um, because, frankly, uh, both the government and the opposition don't have a great track record when it comes to the level of debt and deficit. Um, so it's hard to distinguish between the two positions. Um, so hence the focus on national security. And that has meant that at times, I think some of the issues around China have been, you know, let's put it this way, a little disproportionately weighted. Uh, and that's, of course, causing some angst. But the fundamental question remains, uh, as China continues to grow, as China continues to uh, have more economic clout, and as China continues to demand a louder voice at the table of uh, the international rules-based order, how does Australia, how does the UK, how does the US uh, accommodate that, if indeed they accommodate it at all? So, so in answer to my question, my next question, and of course you were the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, do you see any form of rapprochement regardless of which uh, is the leading party in the next government? And I hear what you're saying about potential coalitions as well, uh, because you mentioned the other countries, the US and the UK. I, I see no sign of rapprochement. In fact, I see a greater splinter between China uh, and the West potentially. But your opinion is more important. Well, I think that certainly the trend does see, and, and, I, and the two words that I hear used are fragmenting or decoupling, um, and there's arguments for both, but I, I prefer fragmenting at this stage. As we see a fragmenting global order, and we do see a Sino-Russian axis on, on the one hand and you know the West, for lack of a better term, on the other, um, there is more tension than there has been for quite some time. Um, certainly, if Labor was to be elected in Australia, uh, that would provide a catalyst for there to be a reset of the relationship with China, not because there suddenly would be a change of policy in Australia, but because it would give the Chinese Communist Party uh, an excuse, frankly, to be able to say, well, look, there's a new government in Australia. Let's see if we can improve uh, what has been a relationship that's been very fraught. Um, if the coalition, if the Morrison government continues, uh, they're not going to have that same opportunity. Um, but I think uh, it would also indicate, though, that the Australian people are pretty comfortable 
uh, with the strong line that the coalition government has adopted with China. Notwithstanding, there are some significant areas of concern, most particularly, of course, some of the deals that are now being done in the South Pacific. Uh, you saw most recently the uh, deal between Solomon Islands and China, which has caused some angst in terms of national security considerations, not only for Australia, but indeed for Australia, New Zealand and ANZUS countries more broadly.